Welcome to the Services Marketing Week 4 post, very post lecture review. Week 4 of the subject brings us into the Services Marketing Service Blueprint Theory. Now this particular framework is very useful as a means by which you can evaluate a service concept or service product and how a service is being delivered and what's required to make it happen. In the class there was a set of workshop activities that I uh, asked you to do in week three. Now one of the things about this particular framework that's present here in the slides and we're going to break protocol for a second to go behind the scenes go back into this particular model is that this is a live object where you can edit the data. So inside this particular slide you have the capacity to input your ratings from a particular week or a particular experience. So if you want to use the experiential content again and use this say perhaps as a holistic review of a product you're engaged in, uh, you can use this particular page in the PowerPoint presentation to run your calculations. What you're seeing on the screen in front of you is a classic radar plot and these devices are particularly useful for being able to track say you know, we've got our three different classes here this week uh, you find that two of them require you to think a lot. One's not so much the thinking, but it's uh, very strong on the reflective exercises. You don't really get a huge amount of emotion out of your uh, cognitive classes. Your pragmatic side is quite high, quite low, somewhere in between. As you're starting to see the charts filling out and the compatibility with your lifestyle, you're largely non existent. But then we have a bit of a mix. And what this does is it allows you to visualize and compare and contrast different aspects, different elements. So, key to this is being able to make use of a data set collect your own data and get value from it. Now, on to the, this week, or the chapter content. To make a service blueprint work, there's a couple of things that you need to have, sort of prior knowledge or pre-existing data to make it work while, worthwhile and make it work. First and foremost, you need a value offer. A service blueprint maps a customer's engagement with your firm, your organization. So if you don't have a product, you don't have something to map. Secondly, you would do in business practice, you do multiple service blueprints per customer group, per block of customers. Because a customer, a specific group of customers, so a market segment worth of customers, will have one particular type of encounter that will include members of other market segments as the other customer within the service encounter. If that's an important facet of what you offer, then you need to map that interrelationship between the different groups of participants in the service scape, in the service environment, and if you don't know who your customers are and you haven't got a really clear picture on them, it's going to make it difficult. Next up, you're going to need the service encounter. Uh, and basically you want this to be as specific as you can make it because you are mapping a process. You're mapping what happens when someone engages with your service. Now within the value offer you want to be looking at what actually the customer wants from the transaction or relationship with your firm and working to there. And lastly you are when you're dealing with the customer, you want to be thinking about the segmentation things here, also in terms of aspects like are they a new customer, existing customer, heavy user, light user. Whatever you can understand about the customer will help when you start using their sort of scenario or their uh, profile inside the mapping of 
I saw his blueprint. Now, a couple of things that also need to be considered. There are some heavy duty theoretical frameworks and concepts inside the chapter. Uh, I'm just working to the assumption you have access to the textbook and you're accessing the book and you're reading these chapters as well as doing the class. The key here is, again, the high contact is where the customer is heavily involved in the production of the service. Low contact is where there is a lot less involvement to the customer's involvement may be restricted to dropping off something that gets serviced and picking it, picking it back up at the end. So if you consider the difference between a dentist and a car mechanic, the dentist is a very high contact system and the car mechanic is a very low contact system. Both have certain requirements in terms of the skills, abilities and capacities of the staff who are employed there but you have considerable variance between the need for the customer must be present during production, so the customers must be scheduled around the production schedule, versus drop off, pick up later. So something like this model, what you're really interested in doing is saying, how can it help me understand or improve my Surface product? So you'll see that the other thing, if you look at this, you'll notice that things like faculty location, facility layout, distribution, product design, mostly product process, product and distribution, scheduling, perhaps pricing, uh, you start to see that there's a bit more of a m mixture and crossover between the elements of the mix. It's not entirely clean that it's one aspect of the mix or another. So we're starting to see that overlap and crossover you can also see things like the subduction model uh, through things like facility layout, it's picking up service scape, scheduling might be picking up other customers, worker skills is picking up the service employees, and capacity planning, quality control, production planning, scheduling, process design, these are picking up the back end the systems element of the subduction model. All these things come together to create a value offer or the processes that facilitate a value offer. So this is higher detail and higher res but basically one other thing that I want to quickly draw your attention to here the high contact systems and the time standards. Uh, this is a thing Service time depends on customer needs, so time is variable. This is also now, you think, the IHIP model. Inconsistency and perishability is showing up. Heterogeneity is showing up here. Product design and facility layout starting to pick up, say, intangibility. So when you can reach these new models, what you want to be doing is saying, how does the material I'm accessing now help me better understand what I've learned before or help me develop my argument or my product or my approach to services marketing how does it develop it further so services is a holistic protocol it is a we teach it in silos and chunks but it is a very much iterative and holistic approach to engaging the customer. So each of these frameworks has a value both mapping backwards onto what you've learnt and a value mapping forwards on what you're going to learn. Now, a couple of things about this particular idea. That a, there's a two by two matrix on screen here and this is one that I started putting together because I was thinking about this we have this idea in services quite frequently that people want uh, to decrease complexity and reduce divergence. And this whole idea is premised on not really fully appreciating what the market wants so much as what makes life easier for the producer. 
On the other hand, the more we look at it, the more we realize that we've got inherent market demand for complex products and customized complex products. People who want to, so there's no inherent good or bad towards complexity and simplicity, and there's no inherent benefit or detriment to divergence. What you want to be doing is you want to be thinking about, well, what happens if we want to increase the rate to which a service diverges per offer and increase its complexity? In that case, you're looking at a fully customized, fully customizable experience that's based on interaction with the customer and creating something unique per offering. If you're increasing the divergence, but you want to increase the simplicity of the product, then you want to have a range of preset menus for people to pick from. And the breadth of your preset menus allows for permutations and combinations that create your increased divergence. Roll down to trying to reduce, reduce the divergence between product offerings. And you start doing things in terms of if you want to increase the complexity, you start with a base product, a common core, and then you start adding on different service options. You'd add on different opportunities. You start bundling together different products. And finally, if you want to reduce divergence, you want to increase simplicity, you move into a specialization mode, a one size fits all protocol. Now, each of these has a value to a certain market type. And this is why you need your segmentation to be guiding your decision making because specialization can give you a market niche. I mean, you could go into the fast food market, set yourself up a hamburger cart down on the end of Lonsdale Street and all you offer is the one burger. No variance, no variation, just the one offering. You'll get a crowd. You'll get some markets. You people will go, hmm, one burger, one choice, one burger. We'll take it. The flip side is that you could go and have you're gonna need more than a hamburger cart for this. You could have a very complicated coffee shop where you can customize every aspect of the experience from the type of cup through to the type of bean, the type of sugar, white, processed, refined, sugar substitutes, unrefined, brown sugar, icing sugar, I don't know, some other sugar type, an actual physical lump of sugar cane which you have to stir your coffee with for a few minutes for it to work. There are crystallized honey, crystallized chocolate, there are a whole bunch of different things you can do. You can make this an incredibly mathematically complicated service and there will be a type of market that will be repelled by it and a type of market that will be attracted to it. So this is the key when you're looking at a service offer and you're thinking about your market is will an increase in complexity or an increase in simplicity be attractive to that audience? Will it repel that or will it repel another type of audience? Will it attract uh, the correct type of audience? So it's all got to be about the segmentation. It's all got to be about what's the value offer my client of choice is looking for and where do they fit into the complexity, simplicity, divergence framework. Now, a couple of other things on just modifying a service. If you do want to, uh, if you do have the opportunity to split, this is called the isolating the technical core. If you think about a fast food restaurants. They have a really good split in the technical core that there is a backstage kitchen area that produces the objects and a drive through restaurant does this beautifully. So the drive through McDonald's uh, just off Barry Drive uh, north around North Bottom Barry intersection. You drive through the drive through there, you pay your money at the first point, you put your order, you pay your money you go to the window and stuff is ready for you. You're not there at the point of production. The point of production arrives to you and hands you stuff through your car window. Flip side that is you, with the technical core separated and isolated, it does give you the opportunity to decide 
to what extent do you need the customer present? And this is where you can set up things like delivery chains, this is where you can use home delivery, uh, a super extended service scape of a home delivery service where there's a centralized kitchen and there's a whole range of products being shifted out that don't have a high level of inseparability. Some products you can't do this with, so obviously things like uh, medicine, dentistry, you need to be present at the point of consumption because you are the object being modified during the service. But things like the dry cleaning or a car mechanic, uh, so if you drop your, your car off down at Repco in Woden or Tugranon or Balconnen, you can go off to work, you can go off somewhere else, you don't have to hang around the place whilst your car is being worked on, they can call you, you can come back and get it. Separate the technical from, separate the production and the consumption. Now the other idea here though is that you want to possibly consider, because we worked the whole principle of embrace or mitigate, services that do have a technical core that can be isolated. Is there a value proposition? Is there a product that can be created where you brought that technical core back in and made it a high contact? For example, let's take the, uh, the Auto Co at Belconnen. At the moment, it's a separated technical core. You drop off your vehicle, you clear off. But if you were to bring that technical core back into a high contact event, it would be you worked on the car with your mechanic. You were experiencing a guided and facilitated car repair that was teaching you how to repair your car and giving you all the experience plus access to the high-end workshops and access to their tools and access to their spare parts bay. So you could take something that's got a separated technical core and flip it around to make it a high contact from a low contact if your market will value that proposition. So this is your key, whenever you come across a thing in a services marketing theory, embrace or mitigate. Do you use it? So here, embracing the technical core, uh, embracing isolating the technical core is to split, is to deal with separability and to split consumption production. To mitigate isolating the core is to say, how do we turn the low contact to the high contact? Is there a value? Same way we come down to uh, the idea of uh, the concept of production lining. And basically this is automating any task you can delegate. Uh, of all the places, uh, the restaurant in the Lego house in Belund has an automated menu, an automated ordering system that uses small Lego pieces. So it's gamified, cutified, and really appeals to the small children, <coughs> like your lecturer, uh, who, whilst at Lego House, go to this restaurant, and it's basically a glorified cafe. The service scape is heavily Lego themed, and you order by creating a little model of out of Lego that represents your order. So it's automated, there are one or two um, serving staff to assist you and guide you, but basically they've taken their invisible systems, they've taken their hardware and contact elements and really made the invisible systems visible, made the processes visible, but also created quite a limited set of options. There's only a certain number of things you can make in order but at the same time created a service value out of it, you are using Lego to order from the menu via an automated pattern recognition system. So there's a whole bunch of technical things that work for it as well. It becomes a part of the value offer and the value proposition. So production lining can also be a means to enhance value for the customer as well as reduce costs and streamline systems for the producer. 
Now a couple of things on um, this aspect, I just want to raise, this is the, one of the many times we're going to mention the employees. There's a whole section of the book dedicated and this whole chapter and week on the role of the employee. But a critical thing here is that once you start multitasking and multi-role employees, you increase the potential for role conflict where you're asking an employee who may be good at service delivery to go into sales or a person who's predominantly about backstage service delivery, uh, the invisible systems, invisible processes to suddenly put them up onto the front stage because you've got a capacity problem. There are some values to doing capacity load shifting through multitasking, but there are also a lot of costs. Uh, particularly, will you get the best customer service from a part-time, most of the time they spend working in the back end doing the delivery of the service and the technical stuff, and now you've got throwing them to the front end because you're in high demand. So you got to also think about this from the perspective of if you're shifting the people who produce the service to the front end to be the people who serve the customers and take their orders because you've got a whole lot of customers up front you might be about to create a detrimental loop so if you have that moment where you're at uh, the McDonald's and you can see all the time is blinking and everything's running late and there's all checkouts are open several of those staff members have been pulled from the behind the scenes and that's why the orders are starting to stack up is that they're taking in more orders than they can process so capacity load shifting has to be managed carefully demand shifting this is one that uh, we do in this subject uh, the time insensitive service for those of you who are listening to the these pre-recorded videos and post-recorded videos because you can listen to them any time, we're demand shifting. We're moving the necessity for you to attend a Monday time slot. So this is a, a key part of one of the aspects of this subject is that I use the time shifting protocol to both unlock the opportunities for the subject, but also to ensure that people who want to do the subject aren't forced out of it by a timetable clash or a, in their case, a peak demand on their time, aka a subject that has uh, classroom-based participation or classroom-based assessment, because I'm prepared to use an off-peak uh, and alternate uh, distribution times and time and sensitive service, I'm using demand shifting to actually reduce the number of people who are in who need to be present in my class. I like to have people come to my class. I like my class being available as an option, but that is basically peak time pricing. There's a two hour window in which you will be able to attend. And then there's the whole rest of the week where you can pick up the digital flexible mode. So let's get this service blueprint down. Let's talk about a couple of the theories a uh, brief example, but also there's some YouTube links for you to follow for yourself a bit later. It's a six step process and it's cyclical. It's non-linear. So step one is we're working to the assumption that you have a service product and that service product has been created and it's been run a few times. So the first assumption of a blueprint is that you are modifying what already exists and you're mapping what already exists. You're also mapping it from the customer's perspective initially. So you want to identify what process, uh, process or processes will be blueprinted, what part of the value offer, what part of the products being brought into consideration here. You then want to think about the customer who uses this process, uses this value offer. Identify them and what you know about them and what type of customers they are having in mind what are the type of customers that they would want to encounter, what are the type of customers they would not want to encounter as their other customers. And also thinking about what extent do they see value in employee contact and or technology contact. Understanding that bit about your market is going to be useful. 
Your step three is that you map the front end of the experience from the customer's perspective. You may need to use a mystery shopper approach, you may need to go experience your own service. But fundamentally, what's of interest here is that you want to be thinking, how does the customer use my service? What needs to be present? Step four is you then look at the interplay between how does the how do the contact employees, the people who engage with the customers, how do they interact with the customers? What's needed to support them? Finally, is that you're looking at what actually takes, you know, what are our critical touch points? What takes place at each of the uh, interaction steps and what's visible and what's the evidence of it? So it brings you down to a little something like the, the service blueprint on the screen here. And this idea is, you'll see that there is the physical evidence. That physical evidence is pretty digital. So let's just be honest here, let's call it evidence. What are the actions that each that the customer takes? And you'll notice here, register, attend, arrive, sign in. It's very, very granular. You can really narrow this down. What's required then in terms of front stage interactions? Arrive at the event, someone's got to greet them, give them, sign them in. For them to be signed in, there needs to be a sign in location. And for that sign in location to be staffed, you need to have people. Now what they've also missed here is that the registration needs to hook around and loop in there. Because if you are looking at this from the uh, perspective of register for the event, manage the registration system. When you sign in, you would like to think that having registered, you've got an attendee, you're on the attendee list, there's a welcome pack with your name on it, there's a name tag, all these aspects that are dependent on the customer registration system working. Same things like you're going to have seating or AV or all these things you need to have organized these elements behind the scenes so you have these this is just on a single object a single like two hour event we can map it for any surface and what you want to be doing in your service blueprint and the blank service blueprints up on the site is you want to be thinking about it from the perspective of how do I use this to understand the product, particularly with regard to the invisible processes, the support processes that need to be present, and the tasks we're asking our employees to undertake. So there is a whole sequence that needs to be mapped out and laid out so you understand how the service product is produced and then what can you do to modify, embrace or mitigate those product opportunities. So the final thing is the links will be up on the, the site. It's worth watching someone go through a couple of service blueprints so you get a bit of experience for them. The more context you have for them, the easier they become and the more you focus your attention to a single market or a single object. Single service with single market is a good starting point. So this basically is about how to modify some services and how to use the service blueprint with an emphasis on a bit of self-discovery in the service blueprint. As always, if there are questions, curiosities or concerns, you can hit me up on email. And that's the easiest way to reach me at the moment.